Do you have a click? Oh, here. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Protocol Berg. And today I'm going to be talking about dynamic IVC or DIVC and how it's going to be creating this new wave of decentralized applications composability. First, a little bit about me. Um, I've been in the Cosmos ecosystem since 2017 when I started my career as an engineer, uh, first, one of the first engineers at Cosmos, working on the protocol side on the Cosmos SDK, later on the IVC protocol. And since 2020, I've been working on uh, the EVM, specifically around interoperability with the launch of Ethermint and then Evmos. So the main question that we ask, today, uh, ask ourselves today, especially when we see the current environment and the landscape of so many different bridges that offer different interoperability solutions across different EVM chains, is like, why is interoperability important? We have multiple different um, bridges across different landscapes. So why is it important? Why is everyone building its own specific bridge? And the first reason why there are so many bridge implementations is because interoperability is important because it allows you to access DeFi Legos that are not available on your chain. So when we think about Ethereum and EVM compatible networks, uh, you have the EVM or the, this VM virtual machine where you can deploy smart contracts and you can build on top of each other. Those are the DeFi Legos. But what happens when you don't find those DeFi Legos on your native chain? So when you, for example, launch a new chain, you don't have the oracles, you don't have the necessarily infra necessary infrastructure, you don't have Chainlink deployed, and you need to start building on top of these critical infrastructure components, these critical dApps, in order to start building your DeFi applications. So interoperability is important because it allows you to take to use those components elsewhere and use them to compose and build better applications. It provides a better user experience, a better developer experience, even though it sometimes has some latency involved. The next one is liquidity. Same reason as before. Uh, when you don't have liquidity enough to trigger liquidations, uh, TVO, or that represents the total value locked in a single chain, is not enough today to represent the available liquidity that exists in the ecosystem overall. So you have more than 160 EVM-compatible chains deployed today that have the vast amount of liquidity in the ecosystem. How do we enable them to compose and to access this liquidity? And that is a key part of interoperability. Uh, accessing that liquidity, bringing it over, and doing some things with, uh, with, the, with the liquidity that you have now available on your chain. And the final one is composability and user experience. It allows us to create better applications, ultimately, for our users to build on top of each other and to um, create new workflows where you can have like interchain farming-like experiences that we, have, that we all experienced in 2020, back in the day. So with interoperability, this and composability, you can access this new user experience and offer them to your end users. So now that we have this global context of like why is everyone building interoperable solutions, let's talk a little bit about the user experience for the end user. How is it today to interact with multiple chains? And my take, building infrastructure that is inter creating this interoperability solution is that it really sucks. It really sucks. Why? Because the first thing when a user, after onboarding to the ecosystem, this is the first thing that a user has. Imagine your, your mom, your family, your friends, that after uh, having to go through all the pain, uh, painful experience of having to maintain the mnemonic keys and handle the private keys, etc., they now see this where you have multiple chains, even though it's the same address, where you have different tokens scattered across different networks, and you don't know where to get started. You, need, you have a chain ID, and all this is really complex for an end user that has never been onboarded and only has, as a reference, the banking experience, even the new banking experience. Um, this is really complex for end users. And this is like their face whenever they get started with interoperability solutions. The second one is token fragmentation. 
So today, because of these many interoperability solutions that we have, the tokens get relayed through multiple ways, and that creates fragmentation in the token and the liquidity. And for the end user, if we don't abstract that complexity, the user gets displayed these multiple denominations across different uh, routes, uh, so to speak. And that creates external complexity, for additional complexity for the user that only wants to know that they have 10 uh, USDC and don't really care where those tokens are located. And so that's a type of user experience that our, we are exposing from a protocol side and also from a client side to our users today. It's really weird. It doesn't make sense for an end user to be exposed to this. The other one, of course, is different formats. We have ERC20 tokens on one side, and then we have native tokens. What's the difference for the user? Like they, it's the same problem that we have today on Ethereum, where, where uh, ETH is not ERC20 compatible. So we created this wrapping abstraction so that we can uh, deposit ETH and then mint a new wrapped token. But that's also complex for the user, and especially when you're talking about like networks like Cosmos, where everything is native and it's not ERC20 compatible, it creates additional friction because now you need to support both standards for interoperability solutions as well. For developers, it's a pain in the ass. But everything calm because we had this interoperability standard on DVM that now there are more than 15, I've heard. And uh, nothing happened when it comes to developing a true interoperability standard on the AVM layer. Um, and that created to that, the effect of that lack of uh, standard about interoperability on the AVM layer is a race of the application specific interoperability on the AVM layer. So we have Wormhole, we have um, Axler, we have CCTP, CCTP CCIP. Uh, Axelar GMP, wormhole, abstraction, arbitrary message, bridges, et cetera. So uh, let's look into a little bit of these and how they're different. Hopefully, uh, this was a solution that was supposed to solve the interoperability problems on the AVM layer. So we have on, uh, on wormhole, we have send payload to AVM, target chain, target address, payload, receiver value, gas limit on uh, Chainlink, CCIP. Receiver, data, token amounts, fee token, and extra arguments for payload. And then uh, Circle, CCTP, uh, send match search with a destination remain, recipient, message body, and returns a sequence number. So you can see already the, the, the similarities across these different application-specific interoperability solutions or bridging solutions, where you have like the target address, even the target chains, but sometimes that is abstracted natively with the chain ID, uh, the data for the payload, and um, some, sometimes they have the sequence. But not even in the order, order of the parameters, they can even have a standard. And so this ultimately creates a different AVI signature because the name of the function is different and the order of the parameters is different. So like not even on these, small ma on these small things, like the ordering of the parameters, we have fully uh, created a standard for interoperability on the EVM side. And the problem is not technical. The problem is a business development problem of not agreeing or not having consensus across different organizations uh, of having a true interoperability solution that is able to offer like, the ultimate user experience to abstract with the end goal of providing a better end user experience. But there's no problem. Cosmos IVC is here. We are providing a better interoperability solution than any of the other EVM uh, compatible bridges. And that's why it's the most popular standard today, right? That's what we think when we talk today about Cosmos IVC and its interoperability solution, um, IVC and uh, that it has different layers of um, the transport authentication and ordering, which is the transport layer, uh, the tau, and the application layer on which you can build applications. But IVC also has its own complexities. Uh, and whenever I try to explain how the IVC protocol works, 
when I start talking about light clients, having to maintain light client states between two different chains, updating the light client state by some actor that is called relayer, um, then we have like the connection between chains and the channels that are also binded with each other, which are parts of the state, and then on top of that, the applications. And whenever I start talking about this architecture to Solidity developers, they're lost in the first um, definition. So how can we provide a better user experience that abstracts these complexities from end developers? And this is a small visualization of how IVC works, which is also not relevant for the end, for the end developer, the Solidity developers that want, just wants to send the packet, does not care about the architecture. They know the IVC is a secure protocol. What about developer experience? And this is a comment on a forum by one of the core developers of IVC, uh, Adi from Informal Systems, that the ad these abstractions, these transport layer um, abstractions, like the channel, the client, the connections, uh, defining its own packet, et cetera, they demand too much effort. And they, the problem with this is that they, it doesn't, you can't deliver any tangible impact, and it slows the pace of innovation. Because you need to know all this before you can get started. And today, IVC is only meant for chain-to-chain -chain interoperability, and we haven't gotten to the next step, which is smart contract to smart contract interoperability, smart contract to chain interoperability, and vice versa, or layer one. So how can we get to that point? And the solution is dynamic IVC. Dynamic IVC is a wrapper around IVC that abstracts all this complexity from the end developer and relies on this core technology, with, which is all known and very robust that all the Cosmos ecosystem today uses. But for the end developer, they only need to have the sender and the packet that defines the data. Everything else is abstracted for the developer. So Dynamic IVC works, uh, has like two core technologies, or like two key pieces of architecture, more specifically, which is the callbacks that everyone needs to define. And uh, if you were here uh, for the past presentation, Susanna and Charlie gave a really, present a really nice diagram of how it works, where an application needs to define the logic for sending a packet and then the uh, logic for receiving a packet. That, that's a callback. So how do you retrieve the package? How do you decode the information? And then how do you process that information in the smart contract layer? So that is also very relevant for this end architecture. And send packet is part of the core transport layer. But again, it's abstracted for the end developer. So why dynamic IVC? Why is it so game changing? Why does it create a new wave of composability? It's because it completely abstracts this complexity of the transport authentication and ordering parts of this protocol, it creates a faster piece of innovation because now you can create smart contracts that are truly interoperable. It provides ecosystem security that we all know today works well in the Cosmos ecosystem with like client verification proofs. And then you can build, with all that in mind, your IVC-enabled decentralized applications. So you can create your own packet data that handles um, a cross-chain contract call or a cross-chain transfer or anything that you want to do that composes with other smart contract. And what's best, it's not only for EVM to EVM interoperability. You can have Solana VM, you can have uh, Cosmo Wasm contracts, et cetera. Everything can be abstracted and can be defined by the application to define its own logic. And for that, we're going to be offering two encoding solutions, with one AVI encoding, which works well for EVM compatibility, and then JSON encoding, which is relevant, especially when we're talking about encoding formats between um, EVM and Cosmo Wasm, or EVM and other um, smart contract architectures. And encoding is necessary for you to define your packet, parse it to bytes, and then um, handle the logic. So when we are talking about like all these application-specific interoperability solutions, for example, wormhole, chain link, um, circles, interoperability solutions that are all getting a lot of traction specifically from, the, from, the, from an industry and uh, enterprise standpoint, that they all define these 
um, different ordering of packet, the different ordering of arguments, uh, different function signatures, etc. The best thing is that all of this can be abstracted, unwrapped by dynamic IVC by providing these interoperability wrappers around existing application-specific protocols where you can define these, like, for example, CCTP or CCIP on top of dynamic IVC. So you can have the same interfaces, which work well or today across different organizations and enterprise solutions, that rely on this very robust transport protocol, which is IVC. And all this can be abstracted and exposed to application developers to build their interoperability solutions. And the other part, which is uh, what Charlie and, and Susanna were just talking about, which, which is the race of the, the importance of handling the packet, which is uh, whenever you receive the packet, how, what do you do afterwards? What do you do in the case of like a success on the counterparty chain or a failure transaction on the counterparty chain? So that's what ADR8 uh, actor callbacks is the name. Um, there's a really good blog post by the IVC core team about it that I would definitely recommend. But basically, what this defines is um, what do you do in case of receiving a packet? What do you do in case of, uh, of a packet timeout or a packet ac acknowledgement whenever it's successful or failure? So that's kind of like the core primitives of this like, callbacks architecture that the smart contract application also needs to define. We're abstracting all this so that the application can define it, and uh, we're providing all the core piece of this pieces of technology so that smart contracts can talk with each other cross-chain uh, via dynamic IVC and using these actor callbacks, ADR aid. Um, and all of this works with our latest technology that we have today on mainnet, which is the EVM extensions. So EVM extensions provide our stateful pre-compiled contracts that provide a seamless communication between smart co the smart contract layer so that you can build uh, applications that interface with native code uh, that is um, also stateful in the sense of providing a state transition for staking, for uh, IVC, for governance, etc. So all the co core technology, uh, core transactions of Cosmos are going to be exposed to the developers in the form uh, of an AVI interface to which they can op um, interface with. So with all, this, with all this information, how interoperability is important, it's ultimately to provide, again, the best user experience possible for our users uh, so that you can build better applications that abstract all the complexities and that can compose with each other to provide new use, new use cases for your end users. At Evmos, we're relying on this interoperability to provide unmatched composability and user experience. And a big part of that is this only liquidity, like all liquidity available, that now it's going to be that applications are going to be able to interact with, for example, on Osmosis or other um, DeFi application-specific blockchains or other smart contracts that are available elsewhere, so that you can interact seamlessly with these applications and liquidity via the interoperability solutions that we're building. At Evmos, we want to truly become the Ethereum canary chain in the sense of providing all the best functionalities uh, for end developers so that they can build these functionalities like account abstraction, passkey technology, intents, dynamic IVC with interoperability um, so that they can build better applications before they get into Ethereum. So we're providing all these functionalities for our users. Thank you very much. And, uh, if anyone has some questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Federico. Uh, are Thanks, there any questions? One? You uh you mentioned that it's kind of like a biz dev problem more than a technical problem to get this stuff passed. So now that the, some of those solutions that you mentioned are getting enterprise adoption, how do you think you can push back against like 
vendor lock-in and the fees that, that like, the, in, the getting, that stuff getting entrenched with uh, the people who are, who are starting to build on top of it? Yeah, so uh, for these, for these uh, application-specific interoperability bridges or interoperability protocols that I mentioned, like circles or link, uh, chain link that are working with, well, Circle is the largest, largest stablecoin issuer, so it has like a lot of enterprise adoption already. And Chainlink is closely working with Swift in order to offer like interoperability solutions for cross-chain payments. Or, um, and so the vendor locking is not a problem when you abstract that for the end user that in a way that under the hood it uses IVC. So like, I'm not saying let's, let's strip everything away that we built on top of these like really powerful, like successful interoperability uh, solutions like the ones that I mentioned, but let's abstract that functionality. Let's provide the same interface, but under a most, more robust protocol, which is IVC. So that's how we can like ensure that the, the protocol is more robust while at the same time maintaining and keeping the vendor locking. Any other questions? <coughs> we have time for another one. If none, thanks again, Federico. Round of applause.